Welcome to the American Folklife Center's 2022 Homegrown at Home concert series. I'm Stephen Winnick, and for many years we've presented the Homegrown concert series featuring the best in traditional folk music and dance from around the world in various rooms and spaces in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. But in the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So now in 2022, this is our third year of homegrown at home concerts because we're still being cautious about bringing audiences together. We have had our collective eye on the Swedish group Kongero for several years now since several Library of Congress staff members saw them in concert at Folk Alliance International a few years ago. So we are very happy to bring them to the series this year. Now to get some more background and context for our concerts, we interview the performers whenever we can. And so I am here today with members of Kongero, Emma, Lota, and Sofia. So welcome, Kongero. Thank you. <laughs> now, one challenge that I have in doing these interviews is pronouncing the names of people from a wide variety of cultures. So I think I'm going to take the cowardly way out. And rather than introducing you by your full names, may I ask you to introduce yourselves by telling our viewers your full names. My name is Emma Björling. And my name is Lotta Andersson. And my name is Sofia hultqvist -Kott. Well, welcome to all three of you, and we're delighted to have you here with us. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Kongero and the music that you do in the group. So first of all, you call the group Swedish Folkapella. So what exactly uh, is the meaning of that term? What, what do you uh, what do you mean by it? Well, we we sat down thinking about how we would explain what we're actually doing. Um, uh, in some way, we are exotic in all kinds of environment. <laughs> uh, we're we're different or or uh yeah exotic in the a cappella world and also in the folk world since we're only using our voices so we try to in some way try to explain that and swedish folk cappella to us it means it's folk music or rooted in traditional music um but we do it a cappella so mm -hmm. we just made up our own genre <laughs> So, and it's a, it's a wonderful sound and, and I think people really enjoy the concert, which of course is live on our website at loc.gov. So I should um, ask you then, how does a Swedish person today, a young Swedish person encounter traditional folk music? What are the mechanisms through which people learn about it even in Sweden? I would say the most... Um common way is um, we start maybe playing an instrument uh, at a, uh, a local music school and then someone uh, suggests uh, that you go to a music camp maybe where you will find traditional music or maybe you have someone in your family that is interested already maybe plays the fiddle or some other traditional instrument and uh, and you get to it that way but i would say that um, most uh, kids in sweden don't know their traditional music that well and are not um, very much exposed to it so it's either by suggestion or by someone you know bringing you in mm -hmm. and that kind of brings us to the question of the education system there in sweden and how that uh, sort of interacts with with the folk music community. Um, can can someone talk about that? Sure. I could um, say something first. Just uh, yeah. there are initiatives uh, with um, traditional musician, musicians bringing um, traditional music into schools with uh, you know touring projects, and you get to try uh, to try to play or. Yeah, at least be exposed to it uh, somewhat. Uh, but as you go further, Emma will tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say school 
and education now has a lot to do with with the exposure to to traditional music in in Sweden because it's not uh, like back in the days it was really a part of our everyday life so uh everyone was singing the songs <clears throat> everyone was dancing and so on and so forth but since the world look a little bit different now uh i guess most people get exposed to it by by a relative or a friend or in school uh and uh if you ever get to hear it <laughs> but yeah so so uh, as Lotta said there are projects um in for smaller children um to to try and play or try to sing or you make a story or something and, and a touring band comes in and, and works with with the children but uh we actually have education traditional uh, music educations in all like levels after the uh what would you call it like um ordinary school mm. so hi after high school yeah. uh you could choose either to to go to a specific music gymnasium as we call it like it's bet somewhere between high school and college for you um and and where you could actually um try at least if you have the right teachers on your school to focus on folk music but after that when you have done your your nine years uh, or sorry your 12 years in school you could choose to go to a specific school uh that is also i mean for in sweden all education is free so mm -hmm. so you could choose to go and and learn whatever you want uh and there are specific schools for for traditional music and world music Mm -hmm. uh, and then you could go on to to university or or college that is very specified for for traditional music and we have four uh folk music or traditional music uh university educations in sweden right now excellent so, so we have about 20 of them i would say in college level mm -hmm. great so we've asked about this or i've asked about this on the sort of general level of how does one do it but i could also ask you individually how did you come to traditional music so why don't we start with sophia since she hasn't had a chance to talk to us yet <laughs> yeah um well i think like i grew up in a family that enjoys all kinds of music and they also listen to a lot of the popular Swedish folk bands um, as I grew up. And then, I don't know, I started playing uh, music in school when I was a kid, uh, but it was just different genres. Um, then I went on uh, to high school and I went to these folk music camps that Lotha talked about. Yeah. And yeah, after that, I just fell in love with the genre and I kept on studying folk music and I am studying right now so I'm at uh, the Royal College of Music in Stockholm mm -hmm. right now yeah <laughs> all right that sounds great and um yeah. Lota how about you what was your path into folk music yeah, I guess uh, kind of similar, although my parents didn't really uh, play or engage in in that genre uh, but like by happenstance, I <laughs> I came to this folk music camp, and uh, it was the best week of my life uh, up until that point. So I was just totally blown away. Uh, I played the fiddle uh, at the time, but I had you know a good ear, and I hadn't really realized that I didn't read the sheet music because it said what what song it was, and then I played that one together with a teacher who also played the same song. Uh, and that had kind of just, um, yeah, I just realized that this might be a problem and I felt really bad. Like I had been cheating and like I could never learn how to play the fiddle. Uh, <laughs> and um, this year at this specific camp, uh, you could uh, apply just like for song on, only with your voice and I thought okay that's fine 
I'll go. Uh, and when we got there, my dad kind of just handed me the, uh, the violin case from out of the trunk and said, here you go. And I played and I sang and I danced and it was awesome. And <laughs> yeah, on that road, <laughs> I'm still on that path. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And, um, and I should say about Emma that she was in our concert series last year. And so we actually have a full interview just with her on the website that you should look for as well. But give us the short version, Emma, of how you also came into folk music. All right. Uh, my paternal granddad played the fiddle. Uh, he played folk music. So I was uh, already without knowing it in that world. Uh, started studying all kinds of genres. Um, singing mostly for me. I played a little bit of piano and, and flute as well, but it was always, I always came back to singing uh, and a lot of choirs. Uh, and then I started taking courses and summer camps and with just with folk music and traditional music in um, specific then. Uh, and then I started uh, when I went to university, I started um doing um well I, i'm actually a, an educated jazz teacher jazz singing teacher which is really weird because i don't sing jazz anymore i love it though uh, but yeah during those years i sort of tilted more and more towards folk music and then i also studied at the royal college of, of music in stockholm that was specifically in traditional music so after, I guess, after maybe six years out of nine that I studied, I was totally like only studying folk music. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. So um, if you're a Swedish traditional singer, um, you're picking up on these songs that have been in tradition for many years. And there's a wide variety of traditional folk songs in Sweden. So tell us a little bit about the different types of songs that you started to learn when you became interested in traditional singing. Uh, a lot of the first ones are, you know, very short uh, dance songs. Uh, so usually uh, uh, with the Polska beat, uh, mm -hmm. heavy one and three and the two in the middle is kind of just to get to the three and just to get to the next one. So three beats. Um, and they could be silly. They could be about, uh, you know, uh, youthful love or just about dancing or about losing your shoes or whatever. <laughs> uh, but those, uh, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of those. Uh, Loads of animals as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, um so that's kind of one type and then of course we have uh, medieval ballads uh, and some of them are about mythical creatures and all of that and others are actually based on <clears throat> true stories <laughs> about um honorable knights uh, and battles that has taken place but you can hardly tell uh, because they've been so very much <laughs> yeah they traveled a bit they, they have traveled and they have changed over time mm -hmm. lots of love songs uh, lots of um, uh, traditional hymns um, with melodies that are more intricate than the ones that were then standardized in into the hymn books um, a lot of music connected to herding culture, uh, where in in our parts, <laughs> um, you took the animals up into uh, the mountains and away from the valleys where you have fertile, fertile land to grow your own food, took the cattle up um, during all of summer, and that was the job of usually elderly women or uh, young girls or young ladies who had not yet been married. So lots of uh, songs uh, suitable for the female voice there. Uh, what else? Of course, joking work. songs and drinking yeah. songs. And <laughs> work songs, sailor work. songs, um, 
railer songs in the little bit more, more modern times, but mm -hmm. also a lot of woodworking or forest working songs, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To keep the pace. Yeah. yeah. And and school songs for learning the alphabet or or the Bible or uh, yeah. Great. And, and educational and many... Sorry, go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I was done. <laughs> I think <laughs> lullabies. Yeah. Oh yes, lullabies, sure. Of course. And then yeah. we do a lot of mouth music, which has no lyrics, and that's just for dancing. Yeah. Right. So I would say, uh, in our repertoire, we have we have music from all kind of like all functions in life, whether it's work or or uh, dancing or or putting a baby to sleep or whatever or telling a story i mean the medieval ballads they were that the newspaper of that time sure. basically even though it took 3 months for it to reach you but, <laughs> <Right. laughs> but yeah so all functions and then of course the the what i call sometimes diary songs that's like from your own heart from your own life things that you just wanted to to sing about um, that was um, yeah your own experiences mm -hmm. so given that there's this wide variety of songs yeah. and that there are many many examples of every type that you've talked about how is it that you pick songs for Kongero to perform and also to do in your workshops uh, oh that's a tricky one <laughs> well I guess, well, we choose songs, often we choose songs with, uh, where we have a clear um, view of what we want to say. So it, either it's, it's a very, very, um, uh, it's a good, good story that we want to tell, or it's a clear or strong emotion that we mm -hmm. could experience. Um, uh, what is that? I just forgot the word. Express, uh, I think. express thank Excellent. you <laughs> um uh so that could either be the way or i mean we write quite a lot of our music ourselves as well so we mix it nowadays it's usually around 50 50 with our, our original music and and the the traditional but i think the song needs to have like a message of some kind or a story we we can tell that we can uh we can stand for uh, that is tricky sometimes. Uh, I actually done another interview about specifically that, <laughs> that the place for a woman or, or the, the woman's place in the society is not what it was. <laughs> and hopefully uh, it will continue to change. <laughs> but yeah, so, so that could be tricky sometimes with the lyrics. And then we take the liberty to change the lyrics sometimes and also we might find a really like a fantastic song piece of song lyrics and and the melody is mm, yeah you know then we take the liberty to to write a new melody so uh, but it needs to be something that all four of us uh, really feel we can uh, i can um, express this and i i feel okay with this message or or i like this song then that I guess that's the easiest way of and to me it's uh, it's a lot about uh, uh, the um, the melodies uh, or like the expression if I listen to a, an archive recording and I get so inspired by this old woman or man who was kind enough to open their kitchen for someone with a microphone back in the 60s and here I have this treasure trove of you know just awesome <laughs> stuff uh, and a lot of times it's just browsing and then uh, find something that I like and I you know start building an arrangement maybe in my head or maybe I'm typing it up and then I bring it to the group and let then we'll see if if it fits or if it's a song I should do, you know, elsewhere. What do you say, Sophia? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel like since the band has uh, existed since 2005, <laughs> we have really like developed a sound and yeah, our way of doing the traditional music. So I think that 
sometimes you just hear like a traditional recording or something and you just like immediately think that this is a Kongyulu song, <laughs> you know, you can like almost hear it in an instant. It's, you know, what fits kind of. Mm -hmm. And for workshops, um, when we do them in Sweden, uh, we usually uh, have a broader variety of songs to choose from because the language is not such a big barrier. Mm -hmm. But when we do them um, in English online or if we do them, you know, in other countries, wherever we go, uh, we choose songs that have not too much lyrics so that we can get into doing the music as soon as possible. And I think more and more since we started touring abroad, not just with the workshop material, but also we really like um, we we understand the the uh, significance of of the music also telling the story because we we I mean we have more concerts abroad or outside Sweden than we have in Sweden, so we need to tell the same story with the music and our arrangements that we do with our words, because mm. most of the times people don't understand what we sing about. And that also goes for really young children in Sweden. They don't understand because it's really old fashioned <laughs> language sometimes. So yeah. yeah, we need to tell the story with, with our music as well. Interesting. And um, so a couple of things came up in that, in your answers that, um, I wanted to ask about anyway, and one of them was um, archives. Of course, we're the Library of Congress. We have a massive archive of traditional songs on every uh, format from cylinder going forward. So I wonder how much time you spend listening to archive recordings and what how important that is to Kongero. I would say really important. <laughs> in um yeah and then you have periods when you when you're looking for new material or when you're going through the material that you already found during uh, listening through uh you could either i mean a lot of the the music has been actually um, um released on on a couple of of cds back in the days and now it's all on spotify uh from the the national archive in sweden uh they chose like 20 sailor songs here you go and they actually released it uh so it made it way more accessible for for everyone to find but now they have digitalized the whole uh, sounding archive so you can actually go onto their website and you can find whatever you want that is just fantastic actually yeah so yeah we use it a lot mm -hmm. yeah and that, to me it's very inspiring uh, uh, to go back to like uh, recordings that I kind of chose uh, to maybe do something with when I was in school like mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago and like I haven't used them all so uh, <laughs> during the pandemic I was kind of um, sorting through and making sure that I had them accessible at home in my computer that you know I could find stuff and there's so many things that I've forgotten and you know I'm eager to <laughs> Uh, to get to and maybe to arrange uh, either for teaching or for Kongero. Yeah, it's amazing when you find. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. go on. Yeah, no, so I was just gonna say I feel like it's also very like included in the education in Swedish folk music as well. Like um, we base the entire education upon. Um, looking at traditional music and searching in the archives and you know yeah uh, I, I there was like um, there's a fiddler in uh, where I come from and Emma as well uh, Shelly Erik Eriksson he's really good mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think he's explained it very well he said that it's like rowing a boat you're just looking backwards but you're rowing forward and that's like traditional music <laughs> That's, that's a good one yeah that is really yeah. Good. <laughs> that's good so i was just going to say it, it's just amazing when you've listened to these recordings so much and you feel like you kind of know the singers you know like you've gotten to know the people through their through their voices on these old recordings so yeah um 
Yeah. And some of them talk too and make jokes and yeah. and tell stories about how they learned that song and yeah, it's mesmerizing. <laughs> All right. So so um we you talk in your concert actually quite a bit about the workshops that you give and I'm interested, you know, you mentioned that your performances are different of course based on whether you're in Sweden or somewhere else and that must be the case with your workshops as well uh, as you mentioned you do, you know, songs with fewer words uh, outside of Sweden. But I guess one of the questions is, what is the main goal of the workshop? Is it is it strictly musical or are you trying to teach about Swedish culture a little bit as well? I would say connecting is the main goal. Mm -hmm. Connecting through music and to the the wonders of, of making music together. And when you start learning something and we all work with it and then it starts sounding good and we make something together. That's what is just amazing. Um, and and just seeing how, how many similarities there are uh, regarding language, regarding <laughs> melodies, culture, uh, old stories, like everything is so similar. You know, wherever yeah. we go, it was the same when we went to Barbados <laughs> to have a workshop with the students at the university in Barbados. And even though it feels really, really far away from Sweden, <laughs> that is that was amazing to connect with them through music. And they say, oh, we have a song about this, too, here, you know. <laughs> That was pretty pretty cool, actually. So I would say that's our main goal. But but yeah, do do you want to continue, Lata? Yeah, I just want to say like, uh, yeah, that's the overall goal. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do uh, the workshops in a way where we have maybe uh, two, three, four part harmonies that are simple enough that everyone gets to learn all of the harmonies mm -hmm. and switch in between them mm -hmm. and it can be like a scramble in your head uh, and at the end you you may choose which one was more comfortable for you but while doing that you get to uh, experience the music uh, with a different viewpoint like if you're doing the melody you have all of the other things around you and if you're doing the low part you kind of see the music from a different angle and uh, i think that um that is important to us because uh, when you are not just doing your thing but you are in this whole thing that we're doing together which is music it's a different kind of feeling uh, it gives you more understanding and more connection um that was one thing, and then I had another. Yeah, and uh, I can say that what what we really um, aim for is uh, all of us has have been to to workshops where you you have a good time there, but when you when you uh, go home, you realize that I didn't bring anything from the workshop that I can actually use, and and that's something that's really important for us that you get something. Uh, that you can use with your choir or your singing group or just singing by yourself in your sh in in the shower basically you should you should have some kind of knowledge um an experience some something that that you have use for afterwards yeah mm -hmm. that's so important <laughs> given that the the folk tradition has a lot of songs that are essentially monophonic right there's there there aren't harmonies in a lot of traditional singing in sweden um what are the source of the harmonic ideas that you are bringing to those kinds of songs yeah we have to invent <laughs> the wheel all the yeah. time yeah <laughs> We have just a few. I think we spoke about this last time as well. Just a few. I think two different two recordings, in any case, uh, of of traditional singing uh, in harmonies, and that's just two people singing together mm -hmm. and making up a harmony as you go. Basically, sometimes singing the melody together and sometimes spreading those two. Yeah. So we are. Yeah, we're inventing the the wheel. All the time. What, we, uh, what we do usually is, I guess, 
could be inspired uh, 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 by, you know, like if you would play a melody uh, on, uh, on a fiddle, for example, and then you play the, the string next to it. So you have a drone going. Mm -hmm. um, so we use drones and then uh, you could use that with lyrics or just plain going on forever, or you can rhythmize it. Uh, um, so that's, you know, kind of one box of arranging technique. And then, uh, you know, second harmony, which is very <laughs> uh, common uh, in Swedish traditional music, at least uh, the past 70, 80 years or something. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you have um, so the, like a third number, oh, like in choirs as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then we work with uh, ostinatos and... Mm -hmm. So we, we actually, we get inspired by the traditional music and how that's been played because the harmony singing hasn't been there so much. Mm -hmm. We are inspired by the, the like classical choir singing. And in some ways when we, um, when we arrange, we are also let ourselves be inspired by the, oh, I don't know, like, the contemporary a cappella scene, how mm -hmm. how they use the voice as an instrument, and so the instrumental use for for a voice, not like um, mimicking an an actual instrument or trying to sound like a trumpet, but like right. the, the rhythmic function or the harmonic function of of uh, the, uh, of instruments. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll say you guys do that really well in the concert. You can hear. <laughs> that influence of contemporary a cappella music, but not in a way that sounds conscious. It just sounds like, oh, that you can, you kind of see where that came from, but it, it fits beautifully into the Swedish context that you're singing. And I think Lotta remembered what she was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> it was about, uh, it was about that, what you can actually do with your voice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that is, I think, important to us. I guess both in concerts but also in workshops that uh, you can use it in so many different ways and everyone has a voice and we can find something you can do with it to make music together mm -hmm. yeah. no that's really important and you, and you know it must be a challenge in your workshops that you probably have people who come to them who are very experienced harmony singers on the one hand and then you also have people come who haven't done it before. Um, how do you bridge that gap in a workshop? I would say it could be quite uh, the like the same amount of problems with both types of, of person. <laughs> yeah. Really unexperienced person that is is very shy maybe or nervous about singing, and someone that is really used to singing in a choir and always singing the alto or the tenor or you know am i going to sing all of them you know it could be that could be a challenge uh, in on both ends actually yeah we just try to create a, an environment that where people feel safe to try and uh and that they get excited to try something and we say you don't have to i mean we're, we're not going to sing this high for a very long time. We're just going to learn this harmony and then you can go back to singing in your own <laughs> comfortable range. Um, but yeah, I think um, we try to keep, uh, like we always say in the beginning, there are no stupid questions. Just if there's something you need to ask or, or something you need to, that you want us to ex explain better or, you know, whatever we, try to keep an open mind and an open environment in our workshops so that everyone yeah. feels welcome wherever they come from. Yeah. A playful, safe space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and usually if someone is very experienced, and in Sweden, many, many people sing in choirs. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I, I, was supposed, I was about to say ridiculous, but it's not, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, then <laughs> you learn how to, uh, how to sing, you know, long vowels, which we don't really do. Um, 
the traditional way of singing is much more close to the speaking voice, mm -hmm. where you don't say don't, you say don't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we use the percussives a lot. So that's something that we need to work with, even with uh, uh, singers that are, you know, uh, used to harmony singing. So there's something for everyone that might be different uh, or challenging, but we, yeah, we have fun and it's all good. Yeah. And also when we're not in Sweden doing workshops, then everybody has a difficulty with the language. So yeah. <laughs> then they're all equals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. So, um, so moving a little bit from the workshop to the performance and, um, uh, what it, describe your process for arranging a song, if you could. I know there's probably more than one process depending on the song, but just some examples. Okay, so most of the time, uh, someone like we write, I write an arrangement, or Sofia does, or Lopa does, or Anna does, uh, and then we come with sort of a draft to the band. Uh, no point in in finishing uh, an arrangement before everyone has yeah. had their say and say yes we want to do this song so you bring it to the band we try it out is this something that we feel like doing uh and yeah okay we want to do this then uh, you go back and you finish the arrangement or you finish the draft i would say it's it could be more or less finished when we finally take it to to the group but I would say it always changes when when um, I get this this part or that harmony, uh, and and I have to make it my own. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna change things, or we figure out things together. So that's one the the most common way where we we make arrangements. Um, the other way is and especially where the traditional dance music someone comes with just a tune and then we have a session and we just jam and and figure things out and in that case the arrangement usually changes over the time like over time so it's not the same from time to time until we have come to a something that we do most of the time yeah <laughs> Uh, but uh, regarding how different it is, you know, it could be different uh, depending on the type of music you are arranging, but also the type of person arranging it. Uh, so both, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, we do it differently. I think I'm the, the, the weakest, um, you know, uh, sheet music person <laughs> in this group. Um, so what I tend to do is I might, um, you know, write the melody into a program and then kind of fiddle around and let uh, the program play it back to me to see, was this what I had in mind or not? Uh, or maybe I use, uh, you know, a four track app on my phone and there's just four Lotta singing different things. Uh, on top of each other and uh, you know finally I get something that is presentable uh, to the group <laughs> and if they like it um, I'll you know uh, finish it finish that draft <laughs> and you know it might be that I had Emma in mind for this melody but she says no 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 I think you should have it uh, and maybe that's the best way uh, and usually uh, who has which part depends on what um, voice quality we want for this particular uh, arrangement or this particular bit of an arrangement. Maybe I want the fluffy high part, then it, it's Emma's. Or maybe I want the uh, very kind of mm, thick um, big sound on the top and then I would choose Anna <laughs> so it's it can be different and I know uh, uh, she usually uh, composes and arranges by the piano and how do you do Emma is it different yeah I do it it depends 
I, I sit in the sofa and and sing along to my brain, <laughs> or I sit by the piano, or I um, record on four track or to the computer, or yeah, I do it uh, in different ways depending on on what kind of song it is. Actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did Kongero start to do this? I mean, what was your the sort of founding of the group like, and how did you begin coming up with these a cappella arrangements? Well, the band started in 2005, and then it was only like jamming the arrangements together. So the first maybe five songs that we started with singing, that was all by ear and like jamming the arrangements together. Uh, and then we started writing the arrangements and I would I actually I started singing in a vocal group on a pretty high level actually from the age of 16. Uh, I was the youngest member in the group uh, and so the others in the band were pretty experienced and I never wrote for the for that group in I think in 10 years. Uh, so it was always someone else writing, but I learned so much from those arrangements and how to write vocal arrangements by being a part of that group. Uh, so I think um, when I started writing, I realized that, huh, I sort of know this, even though I didn't know it because I've been singing in a vocal group for for 10 years or yeah, 12 years already. So uh, yeah, I think... Um, and then we started writing the arrangements down because everyone in in the um, among the the original members, all of us could could write music and had taking arranging courses and and mm -hmm. such. So so yeah, and then we got arrangements from everyone actually. So that was we started already there um, to to get arrangements from everyone, and and we've just continued doing that because that brings variety to to the repertoire and to the arrangements so at the time there weren't really many other folk groups like Ponyero in that sense of being just a vocal group so um what was the swedish folk scene like or folk, folk establishment like and how did you find you fit in uh, there were a few uh vocal groups uh doing similar things to what we do uh there was also a band with both voices and instruments like um we had this well i guess lotta you can tell to talk about this uh forever like the the <laughs> folk music wave that we had and the kind of prog folk uh scene there was uh on a little bit on the side from the traditional like um, fiddlers um, conventions um, uh, and festivals. So I think, but they were sort of parallel uh, and have been since then. So I'm not sure what to say. I think we're just a product of our own experiences, our musical baggage, as I call it, and um, <laughs> in a positive sense, uh, and uh, and the time, you know, uh, because there were so many established, uh, really, really good folk music bands yeah. at the time when Komino started. So, and it's been strong. Sweden has always had us, like since the 60s, 70s, we've had a really like, a lot of folk music bands that have been pretty successful uh, abroad as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, uh, I wasn't an original member, but I would say you didn't plan like let's start a vocal group. This was really, you know, a coincidence mm -hmm. that these four people sat down on a blanket in the may sun yeah. uh, at a convention for uh, higher education in traditional music in the baltic and scandinavian countries mm -hmm. or the countries um and you just sat down and had a lot of fun mm -hmm. and decided to sing for dancing the same night yeah. so it was you know uh, for people with the same interest who were 
uh, at the same place at the same time, sang together, yeah. and it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, that's basically how it started. We just looked at each other and it's like, wow, oh my, <laughs> okay, we have to do something with this. Yeah. <laughs> But we didn't have any like goals like touring abroad or anything for for many years actually. That was uh, that came with Lotta and and also with Anna when the two of them started in the band. I would say that's when all, we all were on the same page and everyone wanted to to start touring more and and explore the world. Yeah. Great. Now you mentioned that there was a sort of wave of of Swedish folk music back around when the group formed, and that of course there was a scene since the '60s and '70s. So talk about the influence of that um, of, of of that whole folk scene that exists there. Sophia, do you want to say something about that? I was very young <laughs> at that time. <laughs> oh no, but I mean the the aftermath of, of the that. Aftermath. Yeah, you, your parents yeah. really listen to that kind of music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say, but I feel like it's very much like still available to this day. Also, I think a lot of young people in the folk music scene in Sweden, like now, they're still listening to that music that was popular like in the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. Um, it's still very much like um, popular now, I feel like, and people are still getting inspired by that. Um, and I think since like tradition is, you know, it's uh, evolving, always moving forward. Uh, and so it's, you know, you can't look past the fact that people are going to and also now when uh, different kinds of music are more available to uh, everybody in the world, then um, yeah, people are getting inspired by other genres and, you know, and electronic music and stuff like that. So it's always changing, <laughs> I feel like, mm -hmm. but yeah. I think uh, that's the beauty of it when you kind of, uh, can feel like a part in a long chain and you kind of just add your new ring to it. Um, and like thinking back when I went to this music camp, there were teachers there and uh, they taught tunes and songs. That was all I knew, but I wanted more. Uh, so I went to more courses and more camps and more stuff and learned more tunes. And uh, in a way you are, uh, you're almost programmed to uh, do do right, and when I realized that this this right that I'm looking for, uh, it was maybe how one person sang one song one day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then yeah. uh, you you need to be humble about it also this person might you know be 80 years old and not performing uh, performing the song the way they wanted it to sound they might not even be able to but you need to be able to listen past that and hear the quality uh, through through it and i think anyone who listens to a lot of um, old recordings can kind of feel that connection to something in between uh, or in behind what you're actually hearing. And if you, if there are lots of uh, recordings of the same person, you can kind of figure out, okay, yeah, this is this or this is that. And uh, uh, when I was younger, I was very much, um, you know, focused on playing the right notes at the right time. Uh, and I guess uh, that's one reason why uh, listening to archive, archive recordings is so important in the educational system here is that, you know, you can hear the same song or the same tune played by mu multiple people and they do not sound the same. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, because uh, people have uh, 
put something of their own in there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think when it comes to the um, to the uh, the folk music wave in Sweden and when they started um, uh, bringing new instruments into to the folk music and and the difference that that, that made and also how uh, that uh, it made well a lot of people that never heard any folk music except for the you know lullabies and and maybe the midsummer's uh, celebrations and christmas and stuff they the, the folk music got a, became available for a broader mass of people and and it it, it was also a, a very strong political movement the the in back in those days now it's it's not that way anymore you could be to the right or to the left and mm-hmm. still play folk music. But at that time, it was really um, quite a lefty uh, movement, <laughs> I would say. And and so it was, um, a, it could be a political statement. It, it could be just love for the music. It could be like a really cool um, gang that you hang hung out with. You know, it could be anything uh but it had it really truly had an impact on the swedish society uh the folk music wave especially at that time the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. yeah it's pretty cool and it sounds and, good when you listen yeah. to it, you know, good music yeah <laughs> yeah that's true it doesn't it it hasn't aged badly that is definitely true yeah. so one of the things that's interesting is there was a record company here in the in the US that actually released a lot of that 1990s Swedish and Norwegian and you know Scandinavian Nordic folk music here so a lot of people here had a chance to hear it um and then sometimes that led them to listen to even older uh recordings yeah. but yeah. also within that folk revival scene so when i first encountered you at folk alliance i actually knew some of your songs from 70s yeah. records that i have <laughs> yeah. so it's kind yeah. of funny you know that's out, that's yeah. out there in the us as well because we have a large population of course of yeah. of nordic uh language speakers uh here all mm-hmm. over but mostly in the midwest so yeah yeah, that's so cool. I think that's still like still to this day, like folk music bands that are really cool, you know, and, and maybe play some rocky folk music or some poppy folk music. They're the perfect gateway drug. Yeah. To get down yeah. to the archive recordings. And it's still that way today, actually. When we get out, when we play with um, Kongiro or our other bands, uh and a lot of kids they come up to us and they say you were the reason that i started listening to folk music and that led me to blah and blah and maybe they study folk music now so so that's pretty that's really really cool actually yeah but it it's one- worked that way yeah and it's wonderful that those archival recordings are there and available so mm-hmm. that once they get that introduction from you they, there's something for them to go to, but yeah. it's also it's also really important what Lota said to remember that those recordings sometimes are like you said, you know, just the way one person sang a song on one day, and yeah. they become fixed in our minds as these artifacts because they're there on recordings. But you know, who knows how they sang it uh, before that or after that? So, but so. Yeah. So, so wonderful to sort of just think about those, you know, that long stream of tradition that you are in. So, so thanks again for your concert. And, and one thing I wanted to mention too is so, Sophia, you're the newest member of the group. We've been talking about this long history of the group. Um, and you had to enter, uh, this established group and become one of the voices. And I guess one question is sort of practical were you using the same arrangements that you had always used and and Sophia did you just have to take someone's part or did you then did you change everything for Sophia's presence <laughs> I think you know it, 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 was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a long process because I started singing with the band during the like at the beginning of the pandemic so um, we had a lot of time to just <laughs> yeah figure things out and you know rehearse together when we were able to meet each other um 
but yeah i i think in the beginning i just uh, took the same because uh, we sang the same arrangements that you have been singing for mm -hmm. a while i think and then i think i just uh, started with taking like the parts that i liked and the parts that were missing you know since there was <laughs> one person right. missing um but then yeah it's always changing we've brought older material into the repertoire and also brought new material in and um, I've changed uh, harmonies here and there from in different songs and stuff so it's really been like a wild ride <laughs> but it's been very much fun I've really enjoyed it it's because um, I haven't been singing in like a vocal group before and I didn't know that it was my thing, but now I know that it is. <laughs> I fell in love with it um, immediately. So, yeah. Wonderful. So um, you, we've mentioned the, the pandemic as, you know, as a kind of background to the last couple of years. Um, and we're to some extent emerging from that now. So, I mean, I guess one question is, um, how it affected the group i mean it put a stop to a lot of the things you were doing i guess but apart from that what else did it do for your two and four conguero yeah well uh as a bit of a background to that in 2019 we spent almost 200 days together in the in the group uh and did about a hundred jobs both uh, in, with uh, concerts and and workshops included uh so um um that was a big difference <laughs> that was <laughs> kind of uh, the the opposite situation then uh yeah. so yeah of course we got to spend time with our spouses and um got to know our, our backyards again but also uh it gave us the time to to write new music and uh, we had a couple of years before the pandemic that was actually really really busy um and we never found the time to to write and rehearse so that's basically all we've done for two years write and rehearse um but yeah we went we had a couple of gigs like every year five yeah. six seven gigs uh, 2020 and and the same in 2021 we had a little bit more maybe 10 last year um but so now we, we we just came home from our first tour since the pandemic and that was it's like yeah we need to learn this again we need to learn how to go on tour again but it was it was so much fun i had lost my packing skills i brought <laughs> way too much stuff <laughs> yeah there's a lot but another thing uh, that we um, we did is that we had time to kind of reevaluate some of the ways in which we have worked uh, both you know with administration and with communication and you know, a lot of stuff that has just, you know, been kind of rolling on however yeah. we we did it. Uh, so that's been good, I think, for all of us um, and going forward. And we also um, found out that, you know, having online workshops uh, was really quite fun and that it also worked for the singers on the other end because they don't have to listen to all of the other singers who don't know what they're supposed to sing they just hear the four of us <laughs> uh, and also uh, this past uh, sunday we had one and uh, we had participants from sweden denmark germany uh, austria belgium canada the us france France. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, um, that can't happen in real life, but it's something that uh, was actually beneficial uh, for us to figure out that we could do uh, something new that we've learned. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, similar to us with the concert series that you're yeah. part of, uh, that, you know, we never thought about having 
artists film videos of themselves and presenting them, or we actually had thought of it, but it didn't, it wasn't a priority, um, mm. certainly until uh, this happened. And then we thought, wow, well, you know, we can, we can do a whole concert series this way. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, it was a real experience and really taught us a lot uh, about um, different models of getting participation in traditional folk arts, which I think is what all of us are, <laughs> are interested in. Yeah. Um, so now that, now that we're emerging a little bit from the pandemic, do you have any project plans, any, anything that, uh, that Kongiro is going to do that you haven't been able to do for a while? Oh yeah. Well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going back to Germany and, uh, Denmark now in May. And then we have, uh, almost five weeks tour planned in Canada that has been postponed since uh, we were supposed to do it in 2020 and it's been postponed now to to this year yeah we have loads of, of tours just piled up that we're trying to get in the, this year or or the next year yeah yeah and we also uh, got um i want to find the word here emma for estradnor for the Oh yeah, oh, the residency. Yeah. We got a residency. Yeah, so uh, we got a residency uh, in, um, yeah, actually <laughs> in the region where Emma and Sofia are from in Jämtland mm -hmm. for uh, making a program for kids aged 8 to 12 or something like that, that we started to develop uh, just before the pandemic hit and uh, yeah it was supposed to be you know uh, doing uh, making up this program and then touring it in schools which we were so much looking forward to and then schools were closed yeah <laughs> we were or they were open but we couldn't get into them yeah. only the kids that were that could mm -hmm. go there so um, uh, those things are also on the horizon for next spring, I think, mm. to do some school tours uh, with a specific program, which is cool. And That's then we great. have a new album with new music in the pipe. I, we did release our live album last year. that We, um, we recorded it in 2019. Uh, and then our label wanted to wait during 2020 and not release it then but since the pandemic just went on uh, <laughs> uh together with him we we decided that we would release it in 2021 so that we did but that was that was um, old material mm -hmm. uh so now we're working on the new material and we have a uh new cd coming up we don't know exactly when we're hopefully next year but we mm -hmm. will see if we get the time to to release it but it is nice to have the live one to show people what you know what your sound is like when you are uh doing it uh in concert and i guess that that does bring up a question in terms of the recording process we haven't really talked about you're making albums but you have made several albums over mm -hmm. the last few years um it's i mean do, do, do you still sing together or do you record your parts in isolation and, and mix them? We sing together. Mm -hmm. I suspected then, that might be true just because of your the way that you work. So yeah. Yeah, we couldn't do it in any other way. We have I think, recorded a couple of songs actually uh, part by part, mm -hmm. uh, just as a studio production and a specific song that we actually don't sing live even. Um, but yeah, we we need to sing together. Mm -hmm. You were saying something, Lotta. Yeah, it, I was saying the same as you, dear. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and and the live album, the recording of that one was actually we had no idea if that would be. I mean, if that the quality of it would be good enough because it was one concert during mm -hmm. one tour and that's it so we we didn't have a huge plan of of making a live album so we recorded all the the concerts on tour or i don't know how people do it but we just recorded one concert in a very very simple way 
actually. Yeah. It and it was because uh, a friend of ours uh, asked, uh, oh, you're in Quebec the same time I am. Uh, can I mix your show? Yeah, of course. Uh, and... Uh, then he suggested uh, he'd record it as well. And we're like, yeah, fine. If it's good, we could use it for something. And it turned out really good. Uh, I like it. And it's my mom's fa favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really important. And I, I suspect that your mom will also love the concert that you recorded for us, the video concert. Um, and we hope that our audience loves that concert and loves this interview as well. Um, so one more time, I would just like to uh, thank the members of Congero for being here uh, with us and for doing this interview and for recording such a lovely video concert. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you.